uh, welcome back to the Independent Thinking Online Book Festival uh, that we're doing in partnership with the Sue Atkins Book Club. The Sue Atkins Book Club, uh, Sue Atkins has brought together the most amazing group of authors for writing children's books or writing books about children for children, books for parents, uh, all with relevance for teachers, for schools, or anybody working with young people. And they've all got, there's always a story within the story. It's been so fascinating and, and moving for me to be speaking to so many people about their stories and why they wrote the book and what is the story within the story. And, and this one that we're looking at now, Tam's Journey, um, uh, which is an amazingly colourful book sitting there on your bookshelf by Amanda Peddle, uh, uh, certainly has a story within the story. So Amanda, welcome. And, um, and thank you. Just, just tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from and how you got to be writing this book and, and, and what's in the book. What's your story within the story? OK, uh, thank you for having me. It's really lovely to be here. So, yes, I'm Amanda Peddle and I am a specialist support practitioner. In uh, Amanda, Swale. stop, stop tapping the table. Stop tapping the table. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> Sit on your hands. I am a specialist support practitioner in Swale in Kent and um, I work with children and families and young people and have done for 20 years. Um, primarily I started working with much older students. Uh, my daughter was diagnosed with ADHD when she was six and she has autism as well um, and I wanted um, after a career in the Royal Air Force and customer facing roles I wanted um, I wanted the holidays off. I actually wasn't that interested about children. I didn't think I really liked other people's children. So I got a job in a secondary school and as the new girl I was given what was sort of sort of led to me was the naughty class. Um, so I started on the Monday and on the Thursday I had this very interesting design technology class um, with with a group of children who I just fell in love with from the word go and found a passion that I, I didn't really expect to have. So um, that became my area of passion and I, I retrained. Um, and over the years, you know, the, the narrative, the story, um, the programme I developed was based around removing shame and stigma by explaining to them how the physiology and the brain and the body actually created emotional response so that they understood that what their body was doing was a part of a normal process of reaction. And by taking the shame out of that conversation, you could really make progress and movement with children sometimes who'd found it much more difficult to talk about feelings and, and just look to be behaviourally difficult. Um, so this just got younger and younger as the years have gone on and behaviours changed and attitudes have changed. The story got younger and then I, I worked in a primary school um, and, and we had the programme and, and we used to call it Colin the Caveman because my dad's name was Colin and he was prehistoric with his attitudes. So, you know, it, it was this whole banter and, and, I, and I said to the kids, oh, I'll turn it into a book one day, I'll turn it into a book one day. And then one day they, they came back to me, a, a group of year five said, you know, you keep saying this and you haven't actually done it. And, and without thinking, I said, yeah, but it's really scary. And they, and they quoted me back to me. Um, everything I'd said, everything I'd done, and they sort of laid down a challenge, really. So I spent the next year or two developing this story. The narrative was easy. And then I got young local young people who are now young adults. Um, they did, they've done the illustrations and the different layers of the graphic design and then a local graphic artist has put that all together for us and uh, and at each stage I kept giving it to the kids to read and say you know is that okay um, and I knew I'd got it right when one of the older boys um, um, turned around and said uh, he read it first through and he went who knew you could talk about your feelings without getting the ump <laughs> And I wish I'd had that when I was in year five. So that's when we stopped. That's when we just took a chance and sent it off. So that was that was the beginning. Um, and we've got two more books, actually, that are coming on to the book club soon, which are the middle and the end. And um, the three books actually make up a children's programme um, that you can do at home, that can be done in school. And it takes children through introducing them to the idea of where how the brain makes emotions, how the body feels emotions, and how the neural pathways can be distracted to soothe. So um, that's 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 Tam's journey in a nutshell. 
Wow. You talked at the beginning, there's like a triangle of those, those sort of the physiology and the, and the neuroscience. What, what, just explain that just a little bit, how those inter, interrelate. So I work on a neuroeducational model, an educational neuroscience, and it's about bringing the physiology, the self and the theory all together to try and have a very normalized conversation with anybody. I mean, I mean, from five to 105, um, it's so important that the language and the semantics around emotions um, have had a real negative connotation to children for many, many years. And, you know, I still have children. I had a little boy ask me last week, am I allowed to cry? You know, and that's heartbreaking when a 10 year old is asking me for permission to cry because he didn't know adults could cry. I said to him, well, I cried yesterday. Oh, I didn't know adults could cry. And, and, uh, and I, just because it was a male it was it was adults generally it wasn't like can I cry because I'm I'm a boy or a male it was it, there was it was a very much male heavy but also this whole family approach you, you know and and, it, and it's very typical still in lots of families that crying is not something that we do and being angry you know looks a certain way uh, and actually sometimes for some children angry doesn't necessarily mean angry angry can mean frustrated or scared or you know, and I really try and move away when I work with children from putting my idea of an emotional context onto them, because my idea of an emotion might be very different to what they're experiencing and my words, I might be then putting onto them. So by taking all of that away, and, and I know it's important and it has its place, but I believe really firmly and, and, and the evidence from these supports that before any of that, if we can have a conversation that's very simple, very colourful and very easy about the fact that our senses interpret our environment, they send messages to the body, the body creates physical feels, we have a response to that. And actually, there are things we can do to soothe that and calm that by distracting the neurons. And, you know, we have we have brains and neurons and body parts and toucans and sloths <laughs> so you, you know it, it we tie it all in you know each book you know works from a so this is the first book the body parts of the second book and then the neuron is the third book so that all comes together to be able to have just a conversation about where that comes from um i think you know one of the children's first words are generally is why mm. you know they do know and then it's closely followed then in part of their development by why. Um, and, and But we're missing a lot of the why and we're moving straight on to lots of feelings words and, you know, and we tell them it's okay, but these kids are logical. They can put a Minecraft castle together in half an hour and make it look like the Taj Mahal. You know, they understand process and process and links. Mm. So, um, you know, that this idea that by, by creating this, sort of early language around having that links and making it an easier conversation um, to have and a less shameful conversation yeah. with no stigma, um, you know, can be life-changing and it, it, is, it has visibly been life-changing for lots of children that, and families that I've worked with. And that, I mean, that comes across this idea of no shame, no stigma that comes across in the book that the, the boy is having these feelings. He doesn't necessarily want those feelings, but they're there. Yeah. And, and then he's feeling bad because he's feeling bad and then it becomes and he ends up you know running from it running into a tree and there's a big in England especially around behavior without creating a twitter storm in my words but there's a big oh please do there's a big push at the moment around behavior is it's just yeah. they're being naughty they need to be yep. sorted they need to do this still they need to follow with the eyes they need to behave they need to learn these strategies of, of of just putting up with whatever goes on in the classroom and focusing and learning and yet there are other people who were talking about um uh, behavior as an unmet need and there are maybe there are yeah. there are emotional issues going on but what you're saying what came across in the comes across in the book quite strongly is there are physiological issues going on as well we've just been speaking to a lady about um food and nutrition yeah. formative yeah. nutrition and they're you know maybe they're just missing certain nutrients as well so there's a far yeah. richer picture then this child just won't sit still. Therefore, no. we're going to have to put him on a or her on a some sort of level of of, of, of behaviour and discipline. What's your what's your take on that going on at the moment? 
you know, I mean, I, uh, the reason I work independently is because a lot of the children I work with won't work with your universal services. So I tend to come in and do the engagement work. Our entire world is filtered through our brains, through our senses. So we live in a world where we are sensory overloaded continually and we don't have enough movement and that myelin proteins that work in the body, in the brain to help regulate some of that emotional um, the chemicals and the hormones, we're not quite so active because we are needing to sit still. And actually when children are moving, that's a very good way of self-regulating because they're dissipating some of that tension. So to be told to sit still and stay still is really difficult. Interestingly, what I'm seeing at the moment is I work in primary and secondary. And I've been asked to look at a lot of year sevens mm. um, and in little groups and collectively and separately because the secondary schools are struggling with them. And actually what I'm seeing is that the year sevens developmentally are actually year fives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're getting into trouble for fidgeting, for twitching, and, and they're not there yet. You know, in secondary, they would normally be there, but due to COVID, they're not there yet. Because they say, is, there a, is there a lockdown pandemic aspect to that as well, yeah? Yeah, and we're only just starting to see it because really we're still in it. Our bodies are still responsive to that. But definitely, I mean, that we all of our messages come through our senses. Everything we interpret in the world comes through our senses, through the brain and into the rest of the body, through the nervous system and so the more sensory impacts we have the more we're trying to filter through at the same time so these children are, are processing more in evolutionary terms than anybody's ever processed before so and and we don't yet know the impact of the pandemic on that and we probably won't for many many years but it will have a sensory impact so having the conversations where they need to understand how their body works and where these emotional responses come from, you know, could be key for some children, especially a more logical child or, you know, a, a child that needs things explaining in a different way. We're all different. And this book certainly is not a one size fits all mm. because that doesn't exist. And that's why these sort of forums are great because you have lots and lots of different approaches. But for many children, this will be, and for their parents and grandparents, this will be a conversation that, you know, can change the way you, you have that conversation about feelings and emotions. Mm. And, and like we said, without judgment, without shame, without blame, without saying you're naughty, there's a deficit. Yeah. We need to sort you out. 100%. It's, it's, yeah. under, it's understanding. And what you said about we've got year sevens who are actually year fives. One of our associates in independent thinking is a, a paediatric neurologist, Dr. Andrew Curran. And there's a phrase that he used years ago when we were in a conversation that stayed with me is you, you can't be older than your brain. No. And if you've got a if you've got a year seven, who's got the brain of a year five, they're a year five. Yeah. So you work with them to, with, with this plasticity, we can accelerate it, we can yeah. change things. But trying to work with them as a defective year seven is, no. is, 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 is the worst possible thing for them as year seven yeah. and ain't going to help going into years eight, nine, 10, 11, into the exam years and beyond. No, and I, I mean, I've got, uh, I saw close friends yesterday and she's the head of a primary school and, and they're seeing the impact. And my sister in law's a primary school teacher. That, that, that deficit is coming up in every year group. So in year, I mean, I saw the year 11s go off and they didn't look like year 11s. They didn't have the swagger of the year 11s. They looked like year nines, bigging it up to be year 11s. And, and I just thought this is, we really have no idea of the impact of this yet, but we're starting to see those delays now in every sort of year group in some way or another. And that makes that difficult because, you know, normally with those year sevens, we might be saying, well, do we need, you know, is there trauma there? Do we need to send to that service? Is there a potential for an ADHD diagnosis? Should we send to that area? Um, in year five, you'd be having a different conversation because you'd be looking at their behavior and development from a different age range. Mm. So the whole idea of catch up is more than just they're behind in maths and English, isn't it? There's a whole a whole ball game of catch up that needs to be addressed. Listen, I could set you off on a million Twitter feeds and get myself into all sorts of trouble with all sorts of people, but um, no, I, I I am very sad at the hard academic um, curriculums that are coming through um the summer schools the extra pressure the testing um it, it is soul destroying for me um as the practitioner that works in the way that I do um because there isn't a huge amount of emphasis 
on that social development and the emotional learning. We've got a social emotional learning curriculum. It doesn't really go into the physiology and the brain development of it. It still focuses on this many words, knowing this many words, knowing how to say this, knowing how to find a safe space. And, and actually, schools have been doing that for years. They've been doing that as they've gone along because they've had to do it. Um, and we're in a bit of a position where, you know, you know, some lovely things are coming up. Actually, schools are already doing that and they're doing it despite to their own areas. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, there is a big gap. And I know schools are getting extra funding. They're getting extra pupil premium to buy things in. Those things don't exist or they're at capacity. So it, it's yeah. not that, yay, we can go and grab some more things for these children when they struggle. Those things aren't there because they've been cut. Well, here's the thing. Tell us, take us, take us through this book. What's, what's this all about? Why is there a sloth? What's going on here? Who's Tam? Why is it going <laughs> Right, so... TAM stands for the amazing me and the journey represents the journey we all go through in personal development through the whole of our lives um, not just the start and then we revisit that at the end it isn't the end it's just the beginning so um, I'll um, you know shall I read the first few pages and then go through to what, to what that would be so um, I shall cover my face up you'll all be delighted so this is TAM Tam lives with his mum in a small house on the edge of a huge forest. He likes to play, read, draw and spend time with his friends. But Tam has a problem. He gets very cross very easily and then he sometimes reacts in ways that he does not understand. He makes his friends sad, he makes his mum sad, but most of all he ends up feeling sad too. Tam often feels upset because he is a kind and loving boy. He just gets very, very cross and very sad. So then Tam runs off into the forest and he's, he's very cross and he's really not looking where he's going. And he runs into a tree. And this is an almond tree. And we chose an almond because the almond is a similar size to a very small piece of brain we have called the amygdala. Um, and then Hetty comes down out of a tree and helps calm Tam down. Um, and we chose a sloth because uh, a few reasons. We support the Sloth Conservation Foundation in Costa Rica and they very kindly let us use their logo to promote that side of things. But sloths are one of our earliest evolutionary ancestors. They are actually one of the oldest living evolved mammals on the planet and their response system is designed so that the slowness gets everything that it needs out of the environment. So because they move so slow, they actually have an algae that covers them. And that algae is so full of nutrients and chemicals and biochemicals that when they are ill, they can use that some of that there to self medicate themselves because it's full of medicinal properties. And there's actually research going on for cancer treatments from how they live. Also, they digest their food over uh, days and days. I think it's something like 60 days. Um, so they get every tiny bit of nutrient out of their food. So I like the idea that sloths look a certain way, but actually the way their body works is perfectly designed for its survival. Were it not for man knocking down forests, their survival system is perfect for their optimal environment. And I think that really reminds me, especially some of the children I work in, is that they might look a certain way, but their system is working for their own safety, their optimal safety. And the, our environment that we're putting around them affects that negatively in the same way that the sloths you know ecosystems are being damaged our children's systems are being damaged and then what we get is something that doesn't quite look like we would expect it to look or we would like it to look you know and the sloths awkward yeah. and it looks lazy and it looks a bit stupid and it's actually really really clever i've used a phrase with teachers over the years thick, thick kids aren't stupid 
this idea well, oh he just doesn't learn he can't do this he can't do that and there's there's a lot going on there so i love that first it was like why a sloth but then we're reading the book you think yeah i get that there's yeah. some, the waters run deep yeah so then uh, she sort of introduces him to this understanding that the senses, our senses, are a bit like this sort of Wi-Fi, this Bluetooth that we've got um, that filters information through to the response system in the brain. And that can create a really good threat system, which is what we're supposed to have. But we don't really need it for what we use it for anymore. And when we are affected by lots and lots of things, noise, dentists people being mean um and and with the program you know the kids draw out their own and, and then you know at the end she's reassuring him and 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 getting the message across that um you know feelings are normal they're absolutely normal and that we're amazing and that just learning to makes us learning to understand what makes us so unique and individual can open up that conversation around those feelings being normal and acceptable. It, it was such a nice, simple way of understanding the reptilian brain, the nature of human evolution that we started off with. That it's there for a purpose. It's it's yeah. over. It's like with anxiety, it overworks its purpose yep. sometimes. It, it, but it's just trying to just trying to help us, just trying to keep us going. And let's understand yeah. that and let's work with that. Yeah. It's just such a really straightforward way of understanding it. In such a and, and with the illustrations that are so bold and so happy and so colourful. Oh, the kids have just been amazing with the illustrations and, and and we literally started with some pencil drawings and you know I've got a little pencil drawing somewhere that I drew on holiday of a little boy with a t-shirt on and, and that's all I had and a couple of ideas and I gave them to Rowan and you know yeah. they've just flown with it and it's been a journey for all of us it still is because self-publishing and you know putting yourself out there I'm not I look confident I'm actually really struggle with being visible so you know that's something that i have to work on all the time that's why i'm fidgeting and the laptop's probably moving but we've still got your message uh, so, we, so it's your journey it's amanda's journey as well as tam's journey it's 100 yeah we're all on a journey where's the name because you, you call her hetty but her actual name is Pash yet where does that come from it's an anagram of therapist <laughs> okay i did wonder i was trying to work out which nationality which ethnicity it was from was it costa rica it doesn't make sense um no. therapist okay does that does anybody get that uh, yeah, when I do, um, so our local virtual schools pay for this program to be, pay for the practitioner program to be delivered in some schools. Yeah. Um, so when we do the training, I always throw a sloth out to anybody who can, um, who can guess what it means. It and, uh, uh, yeah, one of the school counsellors got it really quick. Uh, yeah. The last time, but no one got it on the last training, so no sloth. <laughs> well, we'll edit this bit out then so you don't have to give away too many sloths in the future. <laughs> Where, so we've done a deal with Roving Bookshop. Um, yes. um, they've created a book festival. They book are. Book festival, so you can get the, the book through there. But where? how else can people find you, Amanda? Have you got a, what's your website? What's your, what's your social media? How can people track you down? So the website is insideoutoswyp.com. So yeah. if, but if you just put in Tam's Journey, it pretty much comes up everywhere. So we've got a Tam's Journey Facebook page and an Amanda Pedal Facebook page. We are on Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, you can buy the shop on our Shopify shop, Tam's Journey Shopify. And we are on Amazon, Kindle and Waterstones online. Yeah. Okay. So lots of ways of getting hold yeah, of it. Yeah. Yeah. Loads of ways. But I mean, you know, there is going to be that lovely bookshop there. So. And are you doing sort of online workshops with teachers and parents and children around the country? Is that something that you're doing? Have you mentioned that way? Yeah, I spend um, I spend four full days a week in schools and, and I work direct with children and family. We've got a TAM Together project that's just being funded by Kent Community Foundation. So we've got a TAM practitioner now doing online sessions with families so that they can all have that experience and I'm doing some peer supervision with newly qualified teachers which that I'm really excited about that because that is where we can have the co-regulation conversation and self-regulation conversations that are much more useful in a school setting so yeah I do some bits with social services and early help and yeah, okay. all over the place, really. All over the place. That's 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 what we like. It's such an important message and a, a lovely story and lovely illustrated. And, and I look at sloths in a totally different way now. Next time I look at Ice Age, I shall I shall review my thoughts about the, yeah. what's it called? Not Manny. That's the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sid. Sid. That's the one. Thank you, Amanda. Good luck. Keep Thank it up. Thank you for having me. Take care. Bye. Bye.